Welcome back, everyone. As you can see or could see, the answer was Island of the South. So 56% of you were able to get that question correct. Now, thank you very much for participating. I don't know about you, but I am very invigorated because we have had a great morning. It is continuing into a great afternoon. And it is my pleasure to introduce Rebecca Safavi. And she is with our appellate unit at the Department of Family and Protective um, Services. And I will now turn it over to her. Thank you. Um, so I have been with the DFPS appellate unit since 2013, um, just by way of an introduction. Before I came to, to that position, I was in private practice in Tennessee. I did a little bit of CPS work. Um, most of my practice was divorce and custody. And I think the closest I came to even touching ICWA when I was in Tennessee was, you know, occasionally we would, you know, put it in our affidavit of relinquishment. That was about it. So it's been sort of a steep learning curve since I got down here, but but a very welcome one. So this presentation is just hitting on a few of the highlights that have come out in recent years. Um, I do list um, most of the cases that have come out in Texas that um, touch on ICWA within the last year, uh, but I don't go through specifically every single one of them. Um, from what I understand, we have a pretty diverse audience here today as far as level of expertise and knowledge of ICWA in general. So I tried to stay um, a little bit more general as an appellate attorney. I really love digging into the minutia and the semicolons and you know getting into the weeds. And I know that's not for everybody. So I try to stay away from that today um, and just be a little bit more general. I have included my contact information at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to email me and ask me any questions at all. I love answering questions. Um, I think I have my phone number on there too, but we're still re working remotely. So it's really a lot easier to get in touch with me if you if you just email me. Um, so please do that if you have any questions at all. So, okay, next slide. All right, so first we're gonna talk about Brackeen just real briefly. Um, so for those of you who are not really um, in depth with ICWA, there's a case right now going through the federal courts that will decide whether or not ICWA will remain. Um, and so the ba very basic facts here, are, you know, a couple received placement of an Indian child. Later on, they challenge ICWA because they want to adopt the child. But um, under ICWA, the placement preferences say the child needs to be placed with uh, the tribe or other family members. And again, that is really very pared down <laughs> version of the facts, but that'll get us through just, just today. So, and I'm sorry, the trial that should not say trial court found, that should say district court found. Um, so the North, North District Court of Texas says that uh, they agree with foster parents and um, go through a very long, um, reasoning about why it was unconstitutional in several different ways and strikes down almost all of it. Um, so it is appealed to the Fifth Circuit and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals reverses the North District Court and says, no, no, ICWA is, is constitutional, it's fine. Then uh, there was a motion for rehearing granted and there were oral arguments on that um, not actually that long ago, but we are still waiting to find out what happens. Uh, it, that opinion could come down literally any time. It could come down today, tomorrow, next month. We, we just don't know. Um, it's important to keep an eye on it, though, because it's possible that the, the court may change its mind and decide that they do agree with the district court. Whatever happens, though, even if they do stick with their previous decision, there is almost no doubt that this case is going to work its way all the way to the Texas Supreme Court. So uh, it's really important to keep an eye on this because at some point we're gonna have the ultimate answer about whether or not it was constitutional or unconstitutional. So the implications are, you know, we could very soon see a court say, never mind, this is not good law anymore, or it could go the other way, um, or it could be something in between. For now, best practice and the only practice is to comply with ICWA because right now it is the state of the law. And so we have to comply with it right now. But make sure you keep an eye on this because it, it 
like I said, it could literally change tomorrow. We just don't know. So, all right, we can go on to the next slide. So the first step we get here is, you know, talking about case law is uh, Indian child and who qualifies as an Indian child, because obviously if we don't have an Indian child, we don't have an issue with ICWA. So you can go to the next slide. So we all know that there are lots of myths surrounding this area. Um, we've all heard uh, people say things like, well, I'm one eighth Native American or, you know, other blood quantum issues. And, you know, sometimes that is how it works and sometimes it isn't. And we've all heard uh, the matrilineal or patrilineal uh, issues saying, well, you know, it comes to me through my mother's side and therefore I'm out, well, you know, that might be how it works and it might not be. The point is that the tribe is the one who decides how this works. Okay. Each tribe gets to make its own determination who is and is not a member of their tribe. All right. It is not decided by the, the, the caseworker or the cost representative or the parents or any of that. So, um, so that is uh, just important to, to keep in mind. All right. So um, the important part to keep in mind is if, if you have reason to know that this might be an Indian child, um, then, you know, it's, it's the tribe who gets to decide whether or not this ends up being an Indian child. So now we can go to the next slide. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk about this case. Um, and I apologize. I forgot to put the, the year of this case. This was a 2019 case. Uh, so here, the department filed its petition for termination on December 18th of 2017. And uh, the father identifies Muskogee Creek and Cherokee ancestry. So because now we have reason to know this might be an Indian child, we send out our notices to the, to the different tribes and um, the responses that are received from these tribes say, no, this child is not a member or eligible for membership. This child, you know, ICWA does not apply here. So fine, we get to trial and there's evidence introduced that mother's ancestors are listed on the Dawes Rolls. So the Dawes Rolls um, are a list of people who are part of specific tribes um, as of 1887. And some of the people that are listed on these were emancipated slaves that were living on the reservations. Now, since 1887, some tribes have um, changed you know, the definition of who is and is not eligible for membership and say that these people no longer qualify for membership. So at trial, father states that um, his determination that he and his children are direct descendants from those people listed on the Dawes Rolls should override the tribe's determination. And therefore the trial court erred when it said, well, you know, ICWA doesn't apply here because the tribe said so. The, the father was asking the trial court to essentially take his word for what qualifies as an Indian child over the tribes. Uh, you can go to the next slide now, sorry. So um, the trial court, like I said, says no, you know, the tribe controls this decision. And, uh, you know, no matter what the Dawes rule says, the tribes say no, we're done here. So the parents appeal saying uh, because, or saying that the tribes should have recognized their membership and so ICWA should have applied, so the trial court erred. But the appellate court looks to the BIA guidelines and says, no, the, tr the tribe's determination of who belongs in the tribe is dispositive here. So um, there's nothing the appellate court or the trial court is going to do to override the tribe's determination in this case. So it goes back to the, the fact that it's the moral of the story is that um, it's the tribe. It's not the father, it's not the mother, it's not the caseworker, whatever. It's It all comes back to it's the tribe who gets to decide. And I'm sorry, apparently, um, earlier I misspoke. It is the United States Supreme Court who will decide for Keene, not the Texas Supreme Court. I, I apologize and want to make that correction. So, um, okay, we can go to the next slide. All right, so notice, notice requirements. Uh, like I mentioned a little while ago, and as I'm sure you've heard earlier in the day, once you know or have reason to know there is an Indian child involved in a case, you have to send out um, notice to the, the tribes and very long list of people. So next slide. So the notice requirements actually create uh, quite a few appellate uh, snags for, for us in several different different ways. Uh, because the notice requirements are mandatory, 
uh, that creates an issue. It also creates an issue. What what does know? Like when when should the department know or you know have reason to know that there's an Indian child involved in this? Um, also, the notices must be sent out in a very particular way, and the statutes are very particular about exactly what has to be included in those notices and who gets them and all that sort of stuff. So the cases we're going to talk about um, will sort of go through a, a few of those different um, little snags that we can come across. Uh, it's important to remember that there are a lot of places in ICWA where if you don't get it quite right, um, you will lose your case on appeal. And notice is definitely one of them. Notice is one of those places where, um, you know, if you don't strictly adhere to those notice requirements and what you need to do, you're gonna you're gonna get reversed and, and remanded. So uh, we can go on to the next slide. All right, so we're gonna talk about TR. So this is talking about uh, the issue of notice and knowing or have reasoning or have reason to know that there's an Indian child. So all the reports in this case that were filed from February 2012 to February 20 to January 2015 all stated that every um, relative and parent denied Native American status for them or the children. Then on January 28th of 2015, um, there is uh, another family meeting and the great grandmother indicates that she does have Cherokee heritage. However, she acknowledges that the Cherokee heritage she has is not from a federally recognized tribe. On June 29th, 2015, the mother's attorney asserts the brother of this child who was involved in a different case has Native American heritage. However, the child in this particular case in TR never received a similar uh, Native American designation as the child in the other case. So the court uh, looked at all this and decided that this child is not subject to Isha, I, sorry, ICWA. So the issue on appeal is whether the ICWA was violated because the trial court determined the child was not an Indian child under ICWA and therefore notice was not required. So there is a very specific definition of Indian child or Indian tribe um, and it's any Indian tribe, band, nation, or other organized group or community of Indians recognized as eligible for the services provided to Indians by the secretary because of their status as Indians. And it goes on a little bit from there. But the, my point is that if a tribe does not fall under that you know, part where it is recognized, federally recognized, then ICWA does not apply. And we don't have to send out, and there are no notices that have to be sent out. So because in this case, the only tribe that the grandmother identified as being a member of the tribe was not, or as being a member or eligible, having any connection to, was not recognized by the federal government, uh, the trial court did not err in saying that ICWA does not apply and no notices had to be sent out at all. Uh, and next slide. Oh, sorry, got a little ahead of myself. <laughs> you can keep going. <laughs> So DD, Dee Dee, uh, this was my case, and uh, I learned a very important lesson from this case that I will uh, tell you about at the end of it. So um, some some courts will take up the issue of uh, whether or not ICWA applies uh, sua sponte. So nobody has to bring it up; they'll bring it, they'll recognize it and pull it out and and bring it up on their own. So in this particular case, on April third, two thousand fourteen. Uh, there's a family group conference and in the notes it indicates mom told her caseworker her father was Cherokee and Comanche and then there was a permanency plan filed with the court and that little there's a little box on there that was ticked saying that Native American heritage had been indicated and there are two subsequent plans that were filed that had the same little box ticked and I can tell you because this is my case so I have read the trial transcript the issue did not come up at all at trial um, nobody mentioned Native American heritage or ICWA or said anything about it. Um, on appeal, the parents both appealed the sufficiency of the evidence that um, supported uh, the termination of the parental rights under the Texas Family Code. So again, nobody brought it up. It wasn't even on my radar. But the appellate court went through the clerk's record um, and they determined that there was a reason for the trial court to have known this, that there was an Indian child potentially involved because of those, because of that family group conference and because of those boxes that have been ticked in those plans. But because the trial court never, um, you know, made a, a formal determination because there were never any notices sent out, 
this was a violation of ICWA because there was reason to know that an Indian child was involved, so notices had to be sent. This case was reversed and remanded so that we could provide the appropriate notices to the appropriate tribes to determine if the child was an Indian child. So, um, like I said, this was my case, and I the important lesson that I learned <laughs> was now I look, every time I get a case, I look through the clerk's record pretty thoroughly to look to make sure that um, all the, you know, if there's a box ticked somewhere that says that there's, you know, Native American heritage indicated here, that notices were sent out and that they were done in the proper way and they came back and we have that proper determination whether or not ICWA applies because it can come back and, and really interrupt, uh, you know, the case down the line when you think everything is fine. And next case, or next slide, I suppose. So I mentioned earlier that there are very technical requirements for the notices that have to be sent out. Um, I'm not going to get in and tell you every little thing that is that is required. Um, you know, if, if somebody wants to email me and ask me, you know, in more detail, I'm happy to do that. But there's just are just too many uh, statutes to talk about it, um, you know, in this in this purview. But so this case does sort of talk about how those um, requirements of notice are very technical, and it's very important to pay attention to them. So here on April 1st, 2019, the department files its notice of pending custody proceeding involving Indian child in its uh, termination case, and um, this notice states that the child might be an Indian child. Um, the notice is addressed to both the parents, the BIA, and a particular Cherokee representative. The notice says it has two exhibits, um, additional family history and um, the Indian child family questionnaire, and also the petition, um, but none of the exhibits are actually attached to the notice. Um, the document also claims that there was a return receipt requested, but there was no such receipt that appeared um, in the clerk's record. Okay, next. So um, right before the hearing, the mother requested a continuance because of the failure to comply with ICWA because of these um, these issues. And in that hearing, she explained, um, you know, that she has this heritage and that the notice requirements were complied with um, and the motion was denied um, and, and the hearing went forward. So on appeal, the Court of Appeals finds that um, the notice requirements were not strictly adhered to. And the court recites 1912A and also CFR 23.111. Again, I'm sorry, I'm trying not to get in the weeds, but um, it talks about where the notices must be sent, um, the contents, the names, the birth dates, all those things that have to be in, in those notices. Um, and so the court says, look, this, this involves termination of parental rights. Um, strict compliance with the notice provisions is required and saying, well, we mostly complied, you know, substantial compliance, that's just not enough. And so that case was reversed and remanded. All right, next. All right, so qualified expert witnesses. I know that uh, y'all have talked about that earlier in the day. Um, and of course, I'm not here to tell you who is and is not a qualified ex expert witness. I'm more here to talk to you about um, how badly you need one um, and how the cases talk about that. So next. Okay, right, so um, there is no um, definition like set out exactly. Um, we do know this, that you need a qualified ex expert witness um, for a couple of different things. What you should take away from this is that you might need more than one ex qualified expert witness. Um, you might have one that talks about um, the serious emotional and physical damage to the child, and you might have one to testify the prevailing social and cultural standards of the Indian child's tribe. Um, so you might need to, or you know, start to think about having two separate ones if you can't have one that would talk about both. Um, this often, well, this can come up in a, a number of different ways. Um, so, but just keep that in your mind. And I do have an enormous pile of cases about qualified expert witnesses. Um, so feel free to email me and ask me for, for more examples if you need them, but uh, next slide. So DLNG, um, so here the trial record um, showed that, this, that the department dis didn't designate any expert witnesses at uh, the final hearing at all. Um, 
the witnesses called at trial by the department included the grandmother, the caseworker, and a tribal representative who, from what I understand, testified by telephone. Uh, so she couldn't actually hear the question that was asked her about her tribal affiliation, and so she never actually answered it. Um, she did review and give testimony about uh, the home study, about the grandmother, and why the tribe objected to uh, the, child being the child being placed with her, which I believe had to do with dogs in the home and feces on the floor and just a bad home environment in general. So what she didn't testify to were any facts to establish her as a qualified expert witness. She didn't testify about her background, her education, her training, her experience, um, her position in the tribe, or even, like I said, the name of the tribe itself. So um, ultimately the court found, look, there was no qualified expert witness because she was never qualified as an expert at all. So uh, next slide. Uh, now, I will say one interesting twist on this argument on appeal, or interesting to me anyway, was that um, the department argued that uh, there was actually invited error in this case, saying that you know the mother at trial objected to applying ICWA at all, saying, well, Brackeen exists, and so we shouldn't have to apply ICWA. And um, the Court of Appeal says, no, that doesn't work. You know, The mother objected to applying ICWA at trial, but um, the trial court overruled that objection. And so just because she objected to it and lost that objection, doesn't mean that then you can be lax about qualification of expert witnesses. So again, no matter what Brackeen says at the moment, the best practice is to make sure that you adhere to ICWA. So, okay, next slide. All right, so, and I'm not gonna go through these two because I don't wanna bog you down with a lot of qualified expert witness stuff, but um, the, like I said, there are lots of different qualified ex expert witness cases um, that sometimes come to what seem like nuanced differences um, so two that you might want to think about comparing is in M, where uh, you know the court found that there was no qualified expert witness that was offered, and D E D that should say I D E D I, uh, where the the court found that there was an expert witness even though the magic words of expert witness were not actually used at trial. All right, next slide, please. All right, so we're going to talk a bit a little bit about termination of parental rights. That's fine. Next slide is fine. So as has been mentioned earlier, um, there is a difference in standard of proof. Um, if we're looking at the Texas Family Code, the standard of proof we use for termination of parental rights is clear and convincing. So under 161.001, we have to have clear and convincing evidence of one of these predicate grounds, uh, plus best interest, but that's a different, different kettle of fish. So we're talking about the 161.001 B1 grounds, and we're talking about 1912F. So 1912F, as we all know, we can't have termination of parental rights um, without proof beyond a reasonable doubt that continued um, care and control of this child um, is likely to result in physical or emotional damage, I believe is how it goes. I don't know by heart, but the point is it's beyond a reasonable doubt, which is different uh, than clear and convincing, quite obviously. So keep in mind also that from a pleading standpoint, if you're one of the attorneys out there listening to this, um, in 13 out of 14 courts of appeals, you uh, plead both the family code and ICWA and because the two of those coexist in 13 out of 14 courts of appeals. However, uh, if you are in the 14th court of appeal, you would only plead ICWA because they do not believe that the two coexist. All right, uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about KS a little bit. I know it's sort of an older case, but it is a very good example of you know analysis of this issue. Um, there are other really interesting issues in this case that I'm not going to go over, but um, I do suggest you go over it if you're sort of new to ICWA and want to get more into some of the, the finer details. So here, uh, the mom argued that it's not possible to comply with both the family code and ICWA because family code and ICWA have two different standards. So the jury charge um, imposed beyond a reasonable doubt for both the family code findings and the ICWA grounds. So mom says um, you can't do both. You can't simultaneously comply with both because they're different. So the issue is, does the family code serve, serve as an obstacle to the accomplishment of the execution of the objectives, so that should say, of, of ICWA? So uh, next slide. So 
the Court of Appeals goes through um, several things, but what it basically comes down to is both ICWA and the, the Texas Family Code are addressing similar interests. So when the child's removed from a home, what we're trying to do is address what's in the child's best interest and help the child achieve stability. And both of them, you know, aim to do the same thing. So the concurrent application of both the Texas Family Code and the ICWA standard um, requires the department prove both state and federal grounds, which actually provides an extra layer of protection instead of stripping one away. So the appellate court concludes that the family code is not preempted every time an Indian child is involved in a child custody proceeding. Um, so when ICWA applies, both ICWA and Texas Family Code grounds for termination need to be satisfied. Right, next, right, intervention. Um, this is one that um, is also my case. <laughs> this is uh, so. This is talk about 1911C. Um, if you are an attorney uh, or caseworker, anybody who's who's often involved in um, termination of parental rights cases, you know that it's not uncommon for other parties, you know, grandma, aunt, uncle, whoever, to try to intervene in the case to to get placement of that child. And you know that there's a long list of requirements that um, that need to be fulfilled in order to make sure that that intervention happens and when it happens and all that sort of thing. Well, things get different when we have ICWA. Okay, so under 1911C, in any state court proceeding for the foster care placement of or termination of parental rights to an Indian child, Indian custodian of the child and the Indian child's tribe have a right to intervene at any point in the proceeding. And I really want to point out that at any point in the proceeding, because that's where this is about to come back to. You can go to the next slide. All right, so JJT. Um, so in this case, mom, uh, the child, sorry, was removed from the mother um, after a hospital visit. I believe there were a bunch of bones in different stages of, of healing. Um, so the department files a uh, petition for termination. And on March 1st, 2016, notice is given to the Navajo, Navajo Nation um, of the ongoing case. On August 3rd, 2016, um, they notify the department that the child is eligible for membership. Um, and gave the nation the name of a social worker to coordinate with, but did not formally intervene um, in the case at that time, although they they remain involved. Uh, next, please. So we have the final hearing, uh, June 12, 2017. Um, the Navajo representative is present to testify uh, by telephone, um, and she, sta she states on the record she's going to be re representative for the tribe. So she testifies, and when that's over, uh, the child's ad litem and the parents' attorneys both object to her remaining during the rest of the testimony um, based on, you know, the rule. Uh, they didn't want her to be there because she was, quote, just a witness and not a party, according to them. So the social worker says, okay, well, fine, then the tribe is intervening. We're intervening right now. And the trial court says, no, you're too late. You can't intervene right now. And next slide. So the Court of Appeals um, says, no, that's not accurate. Uh, they go back to 1911C and look at the very plain language of that statute and say the plain language of that statute says intervene at any time, at any point in the proceeding. So even though it's during the final hearing, um, you know, they still have the right to intervene according to the plain language of the statute. So they also point out that Texas Rule of Civil Procedure requires written pleading for a request to intervene, but 1911C has no such requirement, and that controls. So even if there is no written request to intervene from the tribe, they don't need one. 1911C, according to JJT, says uh, you know, they don't need one of those and that 1911C prevails. And so it was reversed and remanded for a new trial. And next, please. So I've listed some of these cases from the last year. Um, and again, I'm happy to provide this list to anybody, um, but you know, there's there's nothing that changed a whole lot in the last year, which is why I didn't pull those, but I mean, they're still important to keep up to date on. You can go to next slide. So like I said, just a few of them. Um, and here's my uh, contact information. Again, we are not in the office right now, so if you call me, I cannot tell you when you actually will find me at that number, um, but I do check my email very frequently, so feel free to email me any questions you might have, um, or if you want a copy of the PowerPoint or anything like that, so feel free to contact me. Oh, you're still muted, Tanya. 
Thank you. That seems to be like the saying of 2021, 2020, you're still muted. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. You're I welcome. just learned a lot and thank you. Everyone, please return at 325, I'm sorry, 330. And we will enter into our final panel. So once again, please return at 3.30. Thank you.